on the way out. If you haven't seen it before, take a look at uh, proposals both for the west side and also for um, housing that's been done in light industrial sections in um, LA, not dissimilar to the, the west side in Syracuse. Also on the way out, you might notice um, posters and their grids. Uh, they're actually ads for the Beaux-Arts Ball, which is something that architecture schools around the country do, and we're no different in that way. Um, but the posters have grids of the students' uh, desks, and then also of their storage cubbies. And so it's this kind of taxonomy of the desk, which, which I like. And because uh, each one of those images, and I noticed students standing in front and trying to find their desk or their friend's desk or someone they don't like's desk, and, uh, and much in the same way that people's lives are legible from their interiors when you go visit somebody, when you have dinner at somebody's house. Uh, so I think about the kind of lineage of people's houses and specifically architects' houses. You're all familiar with Frank Gehry's house in Santa Monica, which was really a kind of vibrant exercise for him to begin to study American vernacular forms and think about domesticity. And it has the vitality of a sketch about it. And uh, uh, about a year ago, I was over at um, Doug's house, and I was impressed by, um, by the I don't know, the, the compression, the intensity of this house, which he shares with his wife, Chris, who's a noted uh, artist who currently works in a floridly ambiguous terrain between animal and vegetable, uh, between art and craft. And the house is this series of spaces uh, which are very, very dense. It's sort of like an American song. And, and the the pieces of the house themselves frame a private garden and there's a forecourt in front of the garage and a studio, uh, one for Doug and one for his wife and all of this intense activity uh, and kind of spatial overlap sits behind a fairly unassuming commercial facade in uh, a Chicago neighborhood on busy Ashland Avenue. And so I thought about this, the kind of everyday nature of this house, but the insertion of something which had great intensity. And it made me think about the earliest projects of Doug Garofalo, which really operated on the suburban home. And he did a series of projects in the Midwest. Uh, the Midwest is where he settled after graduate school at Yale. And I say coming back west because he had been at Notre Dame as an undergraduate. Uh, though he's originally from our neck of the woods in Schenectady. I might mention he was at Notre Dame before the era of studios filled with miniature par Parthenons made of um, sugar cubes. Um, but these, these small additions and transformations of the suburban home recall Charles Moore's house that we had seen a couple of weeks ago in Pat Morton's lecture uh, in Austin which let the original read through. Dogs are a much more radical departure, suggesting something very, very different on the horizon. Uh, leave it to Beaver, as it were, is left far behind in structures that hover above the ground and really confront their setting full throttle. Since those earlier projects, uh, in addition to his life as a teacher at UIC, where he was also interim chair, He's undertaken several high-profile projects, such as the Korean Presbyterian Church, in partnership with Greg Lynn and Michael McInturf. This building converted an old commercial structure in the unlikely setting of a railroad right-of-way in Queens, uh, transforming it in unexpected and, one might say, glorious ways. It was hailed, and I wonder if there was a pun when they wrote hailed, um, as the first building truly conceived and executed with digital media. In several competitions, one for housing in Chicago and another for small campus schools, the emphasis is on a transformation of use, materiality, and form. These projects are speculative in the most engaging ways, prompting disruption on multiple levels in terms of our understanding of program and building. 
Doug Garofalo's practice represents the various ways in, in which we work as architects today, though he's exceptional for excelling in so many, working between the scale of the installation and exhibition design, from the design of carpets and a new line of furniture in China, and to building types as varied as cultural institutions and to housing. All of the work of Garofalo architects since their founding nearly 20 years ago has brought an eye and an intellectual rigor to material and practice. As his bio says, the work of Garofalo architects involves collaborations that cross both geographical boundaries and professional disciplines, extending conventional design practices by taking full advantage of the capacity of electronic media. His office is currently working on the new Hyde Park Art Center in Chicago and the Center for the Visual Arts on the campus of Western Michigan University. A book on his work, part of a new architecture and design series inaugurated by um, Joe Rosa at the Art Institute of Chicago, was recently published in the context of a retrospective of his work. Doug has already begun working with Mark Linder here on a workshop uh, that will be shown uh, formally, I guess, between 10 and noon on Friday. And an exhibition of his work will open March 9th in our own gallery. I look forward very much to seeing that work, and it's a pleasure to welcome Doug Garofalo. Can you all hear me? I think I can hear myself through those speakers. Uh, oh, so now it's on. I get it. Um, yeah, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, we did meet with the students this afternoon, uh, and I think I'm looking forward to Friday already. And as I said to the students, uh, the lecture is in part, uh, a good part, is, to, is set up to speak to the topic of the workshop, which is about scapes um, of various kinds. And for a long time in my office, the word ecosystem and many words like it are bandied about relative to all kinds of projects, different scales. And so I'll be talking about that. Uh, I mean, one other thing about this slide that I think is significant is that you might imagine that that texture is from an aerial photograph, you know, manipulated in Photoshop, inverted, whatever. But in fact, it's a, uh, a computer simulation of land usage uh, relative to agriculture in cities that, you know, some years ago uh, I found. And, and it, it actually speaks to at least one notion of ecosystem, uh, which has to do with prediction and uh, information at a, at a sort of base level. Um, I have to also say that the, the notion of ecosystem will be, at, I'm not trying to present it in a scholarly way, I, I suppose. Uh, it's, it, it will be interpreted for the purposes of this, of this lecture in many, many different ways. Uh, so it probably will be used least in its traditional uh, definition, uh, which has to do with natural and honestly built uh, scapes, such as urban scapes and landscapes. Although you'll see a lot of those, those things too. So I'm gonna go through a lot of work. A lot of it is speculative, as Mark said. Um, and try and introduce it as a introduce the ideas that surround a project as opposed to going through plans and sections. I've I've never found that to be very useful uh, in lectures, so I'm not going to do it. Uh, I hope no one will be too disappointed. But you know, this particular slide is about a project we're working on now, but in a completely different way. When we we made this drawing. Some of you might be familiar with Block 37 in Chicago. Um, right downtown, right across from Federal Plaza, uh, I'm sorry, the Daly Plaza, the one with the Picasso in it. Um, it's been empty for years. It was just bulldozed during the former Daly administration. And it's recently, finally, getting some buildings built. And we were hired by the developers to uh, help them plan the site uh, and start to think about massing. 
And one of the ways we started, actually, what I want to talk about more is the, the word diagram, uh, which we tend to do some form of that almost for every project. So it wasn't just about their program, which was vast and huge and all those other things. Any, any kind of big thing you can think of was in this program. Uh, but we were interested in it in terms of a series of activities, um, adjectives, verbs, and that was really more important to us. And, and also, because of its location, which is hard to show in the aerial, but the location's here, but right here is to the west of the site, is uh, the city plaza. It's right next to a major, major public space in the city, and how that might influence uh, the site as well. Um, so one idea about ecosystem, I suppose, has to do with the city as an, almost as an organism that's highly complex, uh, incorporates so many things, but that last slide, if you think of it as something that's zoomed out and at a certain scale, there's another, there's a whole set of things that influence us, but graphic design uh, seems to be also playing more and more of a role. We're, we're looking at patterns, looking for uh, ideas about patterns that help us explain organization. And this is, uh, I forget the company that did this, uh, you know, they put out catalogs every so often of typefaces, but we got one recently and it was all pattern. And, you know, we've done some things, again, for the Mills Corporation on that Block 37 site uh, that had to do with moray patterns uh, and, you know, that are all about the viewer's uh, relationship to uh, the structure that makes the moray. And these, were, these are static. These are two-dimensional patterns that nevertheless, uh, I suppose, could give some people a headache, but uh, we got interested in them. Um, Mark mentioned uh, the suburban houses we've done. I'll show a couple of newer houses, but you know, back some, what, 17, 18 years ago as the first couple commissions started to get to the office, uh, I didn't imagine when I moved to Chicago that I'd be, you know, the first real commission would come out in a suburb of Chicago. I thought, well, you know, maybe some nice government building downtown or something like that. But, uh, so it, it was this kind of predicament at first that then caused me to think about, well, what are the suburbs and start to do some homework. And there's actually quite a bit uh, obviously written about the suburbs. The two publications on the right are much later. These are after the, some of the commissions I'll, I'll show briefly. Uh, and the one in the middle by skateboarders. Uh, uh, I think pretty clear their attitude to the suburbs. but. And you know the recent work of Keller Easterling and some others, I think, is pretty fascinating. But here's a, if you will, a suite of um, four projects, three of which are built. I bet you can't tell which one is not. Uh, but uh, the first commission we got was this one in Skokie, and I, I don't need to use this. I mean, the uh, the gable house is kind of like a Cape Cod is right there, and everything else is an addition. Uh, and, you know, another one that used to be a ranch house, single story, where we added this on the roof, uh, a kind of a split level down there. This was the camouflage house, which uh, ended up, while not getting built, actually influencing a lot of future work. But, you know, as systems of organization, we were uh, interested in it way back when. I mean, I don't know that we put it in the same terms, but... I think in all these, in particular the first one, the idea was, well, how could we add to that house? We, the, the original house, pretty, pretty damn ugly, you know. So how do we, how do we add on to it, and how do we add on to it a set of characters, really, where everything had its own shape, maybe a similar color, uh, something that would we, we literally saw it as kind of a family of pieces, as opposed to one addition on the house. And a lot of the projects work like that. A much more recent one uh, was completed, I want to say, three years ago, and it was up in Wisconsin for some art collectors. And images like this, which are diagrams really, in part representational, in part not, uh, you know, which conveniently uh, you know, take the house, the existing house, out of the picture. That's it down here, but 
you know, for context, but really it starts to focus on what we we're adding, but how we were adding it relative, relative to these, you know, minimum four distinctive landscape types, you know, from agricultural to mature forest to, you know, suburban, almost like golfscape lawn, et cetera. Um, and the house was, we used animation software. Um, and the reason we used animation software is because the clients had asked us to make, they literally came in and said, we want you to put some additions or an addition on this house that we've never seen before. And so <clears throat> the animation software became important in the sense that we'd, of course we'd be making form, but we'd be making form that uh, changed over time. In other words, when you're in the, inside the structure, you're never, you're never in the same shape, space, twice. You know, just, there's no repetition that way. Um, and these are, this is a relatively small project, actually. Um, and, of course, we studied it uh, using the animation software, you know, doing really crude renderings. We, uh, renderings, if a client needs a sophisticated rendering, we you know, have some former students who do that for a living, and, you know, we'll shop that out. Uh, making molds based on this the kind of information we could get here and you know doing really crude what uh, medieval things like hammering lead over those forms to get the shapes to make the model uh, very fond of this kind of mixture of you know say that's a technology to me in, in a different way but uh, you know that's a technology too um, you know in these sorts of projects you very quickly even in schematic design, start to think about how's it going to be built and what the geometry is and how do we consider the geometry. You know, how do we, how do we cut up that shape and think about building it? Um, so very quick sketches uh, that turn into things that are more specifically about how we're going to build it, more detail. Um, and this is like building an upside down boat is what we decided on. Not exactly, but close. Um, and so we cut, let me go back here for a second. Every single one of these ribs you see here, we cut a section at every single one that we're adding. Uh, those are put into a set of, uh, I'll call them shop drawings, but we never put these out to bid in this way. Um, these are for us, these are for we humans, actually we architects, to keep track of all the pieces. But the way this was made, actually, is, yes, of course, routing machine, but there's all our drawings coming through, uh, streaming through on this screen, just as data, numbers, coordinate system. And, you know, a high school kid pulling the pieces off the, off the bed. This is a little bit different because the table moves in addition to the router moving. And so, uh, there's literally just about the whole job in terms of the structure. Uh, it's three layers of plywood, each, each rib, if you will. Uh, and so they're glued together. And obviously on the layering, you know, no seams align. That's one thing you get from the layering. We got the cross-sectional width we needed to resist the forces. Uh, and then I'll talk about this middle rib, which is longer than the two outside uh, layers uh, in a minute. Uh, shipped to the site and this frame went up in like two days. Uh, they had, you know, the floor joists stick out a little long and they get bolted to those. And the only adjustment to those curves are in these plates. And you could probably guess the only reason those are there is because we couldn't ship these things. We would have had to get a major truck and various permits uh, to get them on site. So we just figured out a way to, um, you know, the, it's, it's basically the strongest part of that particular rib is right there, so that's where we cut it and then bolted it back together on site. By the way, these are all made by a cabinetry shop. It's not a framing contractor. Uh, it's not uh, some other kind of contractor who works with wood and steel. It's a cabinetry shop. And we found them just because they had a, a simple machine that uh, we tested with them, you know, and exactly 
one hour and they could do the job and you know got a great price on it, etc. So frame goes up, um, and this is skipping ahead, but is all skinned with three layers of quarter inch bending plywood, again, overlapping seams, and where necessary on some of those tighter curves, because it is pretty small, belt sander takes that down a little bit. Waterproof membrane, this is what holds out the water. The only reason it couldn't stay there is because the sun will dry and crack that in a minute, or not a minute, but you know, in a month. <laughs> and then there's a titanium siding, a simple kind of a fish scale pattern. And they would, you know, for the kind of flatter parts like this, you know, we knew the, we told them what size diamond to begin with. And when they started to get up into the curves, they measure for the next day's work and adjust the diamond, go back to the shop a little early, cut all those, fold them, and then show up at the job the next day to continue. And you get this kind of pattern uh, going over those forms. And it was very important, you know, per that first diagram, to have some relationship to, from the skin out into the landscape to kind of continue a pattern, in this case, a, a sort of a modified diamond. Um, here's that center rib. So you're looking at three quarter inches of, three quarters of an inch of plywood that comes through. Uh, and then it was an actual plaster, traditional plaster in between, which we really wanted to not paint, but the plaster guy said, well, if you can live with these kind of, these hairline cracks, and we tried to convince the owners that there was nothing wrong with that. It wasn't like it was going to fall on your head ever, uh, but they wanted to paint it because the plaster had this beautiful, almost pearlescent uh, finish to it. It was like it was rubbed down and had a little bit of a sparkle to it. Very subtle, very nice, but it got painted. Uh, so we lost. You do lose battles out there. Um, this is the finished product. You know, the, some of the original things got cut out, but this is just, a, again, to try and continue some of the tectonic forms that enclose space out into things like uh, railings and whatnot. Uh, this is not a very good slide, sorry, but there was this garden shed and this porch, uh, I forget the name of the artist, but there's a custom floor, it's like a painting uh, that you walk on. It's really a beautiful little spot. Canopy design, I won't really get into that. But. Another house uh, <coughs> done after the first one uh, up in Green Bay, Wisconsin. And uh, I, I feel very fortunate sometimes. I, I'm not even sure, I think it's somebody who taught at the University of Wisconsin, who's friends of the owner, said, oh, you should try this guy down in Chicago. And he called, and within 10 minutes of receiving photos in the mail, we had the job. I don't, there was no interview. <laughs> it's, it's just bizarre. And this is my client. Uh, and he, his passion, I mean, he owns a paper company, so we had a bit more budget than we're used to on, on this project. But his real passion is racing slot cars, you know, about this big. <laughs> and that's his team. And I tell you, it's really sophisticated, you know. Uh, they, I think they race over at his house probably at least once a month. Uh, people from all over the world come there. <laughs> he builds his own tracks, you know, constantly. So this one, that yellow is from the addition we did. I mean, he was very proud to I don't know what he called it, you know, I, he gave us a, a compliment by using that yellow. I, I forget how he put it, but uh, when they're up there racing these things, uh, you can't see the cars. I mean, they go that fast. They're just a blur. So um, we, don't, we always look at precedent, uh, no matter what. You know, you, it's, it's good to look at what's come before, whether it's used explicitly or not. So I think this, I think this is the Pirelli factory. Uh, Fiat, factory. Fiat factory, and it's near Milan, or? Fiat, yeah. Yeah. Turin. Turin. Yeah. And it's basically got a race track on the, or a test track on the roof, um, which I find pretty amazing. And mark the year, you know better than I do. 20s, 30s, something like that. 27, 27 sounds good. 
1927. Uh, again, I'm skipping a lot of stuff here in the beginning, but uh, again, we use the same animation program, and you know, you ghost out the house, but then we worked on this ribbon that was meant to be continuous. We weren't trying to make a track. We weren't trying to make the whole house curvilinear. We just thought, let's make this legible uh, ribbon that flows through the house and to kind of capture program, if you will. And again, crude, these are really screen captures uh, of the house. And the gray is obviously existing house, but there still was extensions we made to the house. Uh, I'll explain that in a minute. And tr again, trying to, this notion that the systematics, I suppose, of the scheme, this idea of ribboning and continuous tracking, if you will, goes right out into the landscape. Not so continuously here, you'll see that in some later projects, but certainly related to what we did in the form of the additions. Uh, this is the house from the rear. Uh, this was all meant to be, we had uh, a roofer who was gonna put this membrane, this rubberized membrane, which we could more or less do any color we wanted. Uh, and they're out there, they're measuring, and we're on site, and all of a sudden he tells us, well, oh, I, I can't guarantee the roof. I mean, we don't usually put it on curves. So we kicked the guy off site and <laughs> went back to the drawing board. And I have to give the owner credit. He goes, you know, uh, I know this guy who makes fiberglass bodies for racing cars. I mean, real racing cars, not the small ones. So we had a, we had a, a meeting with him out there, and he just looked at it and looked at the construction. Again, it's all uh, this kind of bended plywood around trusses and everything. The structure is steel, and it's inside. Uh, and he just looked at it and said, oh, I can do that. And we started asking him questions. Is it going to last? Is it going to crack? What about freeze-thaw? And you know, to everything we heard, no problem. And we said, well, are you going to guarantee it? He's like, of course I will. You know? And so we got it done. It's all fiberglass. Um, funny story about this. Um, I mean, his passion is racing, right? But uh, his wife uh, is really into gardening and bird watching. And this is a pretty as you can see, a steeply sloping site. And when we're designing the house, we're inside the existing house, which is here, looking out. And it looks out over Green Bay. And they said, well, they, they love to watch particular birds at a particular time of year that uh, nest and gather in this tree. Well, you notice the tree's not there, right? So prior to that, we designed this deck. It goes up from the house. Actually, it doesn't go down. It goes up probably a raise of about four feet. Uh, it's all steel grating, but it was meant to sit in the top of this tree so they could walk out there and be, literally be with the birds. Well, the contractor lost control of like a, uh, one of their digging machines, rolled down the hills, <laughs> took out the tree. Um, we built this thing anyway, and, and they've already got a tree planted here for I don't know how long that's going to take. <laughs> It'll happen someday. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty great structure. It's, it's pretty wonderful to be out there. Uh, not for the faint of heart, though. Um, and a lot of ideas about uh, transparency. You know, from the road, which is still a little, just a touch uphill from here, you look right through what is essentially the living area. And, you know, in the spring and fall, these trees lose their leaves in the bays down here. Um, it's that room right there. Um, more pictures uh, of the house. Interiors, uh, that looks small, but this room is quite large. And so we have the ribbon on the exterior. We developed this, another kind of wooden ribbon going the other way for the floor, which is, I, I think it's about nine inch difference from the perimeter to this platform. And then as it comes up and wraps, the slats start opening up, and all, you know, a lot of the lighting is behind there. Uh, we designed a fireplace some years ago, a hanging fireplace that rotates, that's it. Um, more shots. And just to carry this idea to really beat it into the ground of the tracking and the riveting, uh, they have a lot of clothes. 
So we got one of these systems out of a laundromat, or a, what, yeah, a laundry catalog. Uh, and so they kind of dial in what they want to wear and the, the clothes come to them. You're looking at it in, in the reflection of a mirror. But uh, so there's that. Um, I'll show you two more houses before we jump up and scale. These are in progress. This one is for a very close friend of mine uh, from years ago before Notre Dame is what it is today. Mark's very right about that comment. Um, it's up in north of Grand Rapids and they own this land. He grew up in, uh, where is it? There's, I think it's this house here. Uh, and the road is built to about there and then, you know, we've been helping get this built to here and the site's roughly there. And heavily wooded as you could see from the last slide. I only have a few slides of this house. But the idea is that this house, they have three kids, you know, and what, 10 years from now, 12 years from now, they'll all be out of the house, college, moved out. So the idea was to get a pretty big house initially, but a house that they could close down and not heat cool for forever. So the house is kind of zoned to begin with. Um, and there's sort of two elements, if you will, if I could simplify it that much. You, you come up a hill on the driveway and the garage is under here, but this whole thing is a, kind of a playing field. They agreed not to mow down any, they didn't want to take down any trees except where they had to to build the house. So there's this artificial playing field here. I don't have it on the model, but you know, the place is surrounded, it's in a forest. And then kids' bedrooms here, and then this you know, living, dining, and master bedroom in this volume that floats above the ground, that's all gonna be done in copper. Uh, and these are elevations. So there's that copper volume, you know, garage. There's the landscape that comes on the roof of the garages. And this is you know, from the other side. I don't know that the deck will turn out the same, but they love the deck of the other house. We usually don't do something like that. We always do the stupid thing, which is start from scratch instead of, you know, transferring it from one set of drawings to the next. Um, that's that house. The foundations are in the ground, but winter up there is kind of like winter here. Not a lot of, not a lot of construction happens. This house is in Decatur, Illinois. Completely different landscape. Uh, rolling hills. Uh, it's south of Chicago, so it's not as flat as what you find around Chicago. And you come into the site this way, and there's a little road that peels off. You can see a trace of it, dirt road. And the house is situated here. It's kind of a pond, horse barn. Uh, some friends of theirs who have an underground house here. And this is a plan of the house. And it's, it's essentially two volumes. One, uh, one that's bendy, I'll say. The other one that's almost mesian, this glass box. And then over all that is this roof that's really an allusion to the landscape. It sort of gathers in the two volumes, but, but not quite, uh, as you'll see. Um, some wire frames of that where you can really start to see the volumes, I think, better here. Um, again, it's almost a mesian box living, dining, study, small bathroom. Kitchen is, is the sort of center of all activity. You, front doors there, out onto this deck there. Um, exercise room, all the bedrooms are in this end of the house. And then you can see this kind of lightly, gently folding rooftop. Um, these were taken uh, end of last summer. Um, and you can start to get a sense of that roof uh, from various angles. This bottom one was taken a little bit later. Uh, so there's this uh, cedar siding we're using. And then also this plastic uh, fluted material, translucent material that, that it's uh, not Calawalt, but uh, much cheaper than Calawalt. It's kind of like a polycarbonate. I don't know what to call it, honestly. It's, it's so lightweight. Uh, and that's a corridor up to the bedrooms, and that's, that's where that is. Um, and this is, this is that driveway which turns in. That's a garage, and I think something we try and do is never 
present the garage first and the house uh, doesn't always work but so you you come around that corner of those that forest I showed you in the site plan if you can remember uh, and you know this is kind of the view you eventually get and uh, that's looking at the end it's it's not clear here but the uh, the entry is in between here in between those two volumes this is master bedroom at one end of the uh, the uh, you know that kind of bended volume here, and there's a this got added later a, um, a basement. You know, people and their families, right? We got the job. They had two girls, twins. Uh, she was pregnant at the time. We're halfway through design development. She had her baby, except it wasn't a baby. It was another set of twins. And uh, so we started to really work with this idea of the twin volumes and <laughs> X and Y stuff. And we just sort of threw our hands up at a certain point. Uh, again, a similar shot, that, that plastic wall and the master bedroom and then the glass box. And I think this actually says a lot about the house, this particular shot, the way the you know, this particular volume slides out from underneath that roof. It should be just about done by now. I, I, think, I think they're moved in at this point. Okay, so we're gonna switch and scale a little bit from the houses. Uh, again, I talked about these patterns and, you know, it's really, to me, uh, relative to this notion of an ecosystem about repetition and variation, a much hackneyed set of terms, but, uh, Having recently been in Spain and looked at a lot of tile patterns, it's just amazing to me, you know, what you can do with some very, very simple geometric shapes. So, oops, I'm sorry. Uh, these are all circles, but the variation is that they're not all the same size and so on and so forth. Same with these. And your eyes start, you stare at it long enough and you start to see things. Uh, who needs drugs, right? <laughs> uh, but that idea of repetition and variation played into, to some capacity, into this competition that was uh, uh, basically sponsored by, among other people, the CHA, the Chicago Housing Authority. Mark was involved with this. Uh, and we got a whole block south of UIC where I teach, and I forget the number of units. It was something like... 100, 120, 80, somewhere around there. It was pretty dense. The, the call was for a pretty dense development. But mixed income was the real key, uh, which is it's very hard. Uh, if, you're, if you live in Chicago, to imagine mixed income down in this area is kind of rough. Um, but anyway, here's the whole block uh, shot looking down the model. Uh, and you see these orange lines, you know, so from this orange line up is, call it ground floor. You know, traditionally in Chicago, you'd have alleys, never bending like that, but you have alleys uh, cutting through blocks and garages either side and whatever kind of house on either side. So we wanted to maintain some of the accessible units as uh, single story units. Um, and from this line to this line is the next level up where, you know, instead of the grain going this way, uh, those are, that grain is spanned with other elements. I'll show you those in a minute for the second level. And there's a community garden, you know, that spans over the alley. And then the third level is, in a sense, duplexes that we thought of as towers. Uh, some, most of the time connected to the second floor, but not always. Um, you know, again, back to this idea of repetition, variation, patterning. Um, we tried to think of that in terms of building systems, even though the drawing <coughs> might or might not to you look artistic and all those nice things. It's very much about design, but it's more than anything about our intent for the site. Um, you know, there's that alley system. Uh, there's a kind of a composite of many of these layers. This is the spanning elements that go across those, which are precast concrete walls here, you know, towers, uh, et cetera. So it's, all, it's figured out to be very systematic and as much as possible prefabricated. That's how we thought we could meet the cost requirements. 
Um, and here's kind of a sequencing, you know, precast panels, some steel work, we tried to minimize that, you know, mostly wood framing, and then prefabricated panels, brick panels, and metal siding for some of those towers. Um, some views down the street. The first floor units were meant to have the possibility of home office for uh, income and more views of the, of the street and a, you know, a cutaway section looking down you know, on axis with the alley again. Uh, this, honestly, this looks more like my wife's work, but uh, sort of a different kind of, it's literally an eco ecosystem here, the, the stuff on the left, uh, both are. Um, but again, this idea of pattern, but now thinking about it more three-dimensionally. And uh, boy, there's just, I mean, how many, how many geometries could we possibly find in there, right? On the other hand, it's, maybe it's one geometry that just has a certain way of repeating itself at different scales that makes that look much more complicated than it is in the end. And, uh, you know, when we did the Korean church, it was one of the first uses of, uh, it wasn't called Maya software then, it was just called Alias, and it was very crude. Uh, but repetition and variation was very much a part of what we tried to do relative to the form of the building. Uh, this, this literally is, if there is a backside to the building, this is it. Uh, but, um, and, and in fact it's an exit stair off the sanctuary, which is all this with a bridge going back to parking. So it has pretty rudimentary <laughs> functional uh, requirements, or not requirements, it serves rudimentary functional needs, but you know, we saw it as an opportunity uh, to, to work on some of the things we wanted to work on. Uh, Mark already said, uh, you know, it's in Queens. It used to actually be a perfume factory, this pretty nice deco building, uh, and the building was shaped just as you see it, the entire two-story building, so the entire sanctuary is basically on the roof of the existing building. Um, the clients really wanted us to, you know, completely do a facelift. They had no interest in the historic qualities of this building, and uh, this is being really generous. I mean, it didn't look like that when we got it, or started working on it. Um, there's some interesting things about the site, though. There's the railways here. Um, there's some parking across the street we thought at one time, but they really can't use that. They don't own that land. So on the one hand, you have the front door, I'll say for visitors, which is this. We changed it, but, uh, but for the congregation, they come into this parking lot and then go up this set of platforms, ramps, et cetera, into the building here. It's not really showing on this rendering. And here's that exit stair. So there's the sanctuary on what was the roof of the old building. Um, you can see it very clearly here. Two-story building, everything from that line up is new. Um, and you can, these are obviously the built photos. Sanctuary and then a wedding chapel below that. It's, it's really important to know that this is a really tight budget, number one, this project. And number two, it wasn't just like all we did was make a a sanctuary. There's a cafeteria and space to eat, which uh, you know could serve somewhere in the neighborhood of 800 to 900 people at a time. Uh, wedding chapel, all sorts of classrooms, office space, gallery space. It's a very, very mixed program. Um, but you know, it's it's always just called a church. Um, diagrams, you know, that talked about the construction. When we did the, or when our engineer did the structural analysis, you know, it was determined that the roof could support the load of people, the amount of people we we're going to put up there, but it could not support anything else. So that roof structure is completely independent of the building structure that exists, which means one bay of, or one row of columns had to pierce through the building. Uh, 
We had rules of thumb like we couldn't be within, I think it was five feet of any existing column. So that's sort of one thing that factors into an equation. The other is to get this thing built is, uh, instead of worrying about the spacing being all the same of the columns, what we worried about, not worried, but we made work was that length of the, that member is always the same. There's only one length there. So the joists that span from truss to truss are all the same. There's one size. Save them uh, lots of money. These trusses, <laughs> the major long span trusses, are all the same size. Uh, they're just at different heights. So the only real variation is height of column and spacing of column. So we're trying to factor in the limitations of each to get this thing to work. Uh, finished product, you know, entryway. The only iconography on the building is very subtle. That's, uh, there's steel grating here and then steel beams here. Uh, and actually, this is cow wall. You know, all <laughs> two and a half stories of it. Um, and more shots of that, of that exit stair. You can start to see the stairwell. Um, I mean, one reason we did that is when you come out of the church, if you're going out to the parking lot, you have this, you're looking west and you're looking at the island of Manhattan there. It's a pretty spectacular view. Uh, on the roof of the existing building is what this would have been, but right now you're between the sanctuary. Uh, there is a room over here, but it's, it's one of these circulation tubes that we developed. And, you know, more shots of the interior. Let's start to give you the idea, an idea of the character of the spaces. You know, the lights were very important. I mean, this is all drywall and metal framing, but the lights are important because when the congregation is sitting here, they're not staring into lights. They're looking at the pastor, uh, and they're seeing uh, a much subtler version of what the lights do. Um, another institutional project, this is a competition uh, some of you might have heard about for the Guadalajara National Library. And again, this notion of starting with things like word diagrams, you know, in part this is taking their program, you know, the zoning of their program, and some of the other program elements uh, that would cross over these zones, but also adding, you know, what we thought was happening in some of those programs to that diagram. Did this give us a plan of the building? No, not at all. It was just more a set of relationships that we tried to test whatever scheme we came up with against. Um, we started thinking about the whole idea of going to the library. I mean, talk about, uh, if you think of an ecosystem as, uh, a, as information, you know, how do you navigate information when you're after a, a certain kind of information? Um, there's a lot of people studying this, and uh, I forget the name of the program. Some of you probably recognize this, but you can punch words into that program, and you immediately get an array or a network of related words. And you can start to click on these, and another thing branches off and branches off. Uh, this is a diagram of an internet search. I don't know where it starts, but you know it sort of goes out in all directions. and. Uh, uh, so information, as a, I'll call it as an ecosystem, is quite complicated. So we were thinking a lot about navigation through this building. Uh, we thought about a lot about the kinds of information and how that information is presented back to you. And these days it seems like a lot of it has to do with logos or symbols, you know. Some, we let Microsoft tell us what they are, you know, which I think is a big mistake. But there they are. Um, so you're always going through this kind of scape or landscape of information that you have to make choices. And it's, and it's more often than not, not necessarily presented as a grid, but presented as this uh, scape of information you have to get through by making choices. It's all interconnected at any given moment. So we started making diagrams that had to do with maybe how landscape could become more active in the experience of the library. Um, and we started to analyze the program in very 
crude terms to kind of break it down to workable uh, diagrams that then we could put back together. So the stacks, the paths through the stacks, um, columns, structure, uh, which already start to show, you know, the ways that the uh, paths might go through them. Um, just to show you, we did make pretty detailed plans and they do work, uh, and they do work pretty well relative to that initial diagram I showed you. Um, and views, this would have been uh, the plaza side of the building, whereas the road was on the other side of the building. The idea was you'd come, you could go to the park spaces we, we designed by just walking under the library, or you could go right into the library through the entry. You know, you start to get inside here and you go up. These figures are essentially interior spaces that get carved back out through the volume. And they start to, it's this thing about information again, they allow you to connect uh, various kinds of information together dependent on where you are in the building. And uh, you know, just more shots of the renderings we submitted. Uh, and again, another shot. The facade was, you know, uh, meant to be a rain screen, and we were starting to, we had started to work on panels that, because it was such a huge building, we thought, well, the way you get curvature is to have a panel that already has just a ever so slight curvature in it, but you could multiply that and get a whole array of of different kinds of curvature on a larger scale through the repetition of that one panel or two panels in a way. Um, switching again, you know, to I want to, I guess I want to talk about one or two institutional projects, one being the Hyde Park Arts Center. And our sense of working in Chicago is that these sorts of projects in particular uh, really help, or not help, wrong word, uh, uh, allow or promote the idea of, you know, yourself in the city and that this, you know, a project like the Hyde Park Art Center kind of allows you to think about your position in the city relative to the city itself. So it's not like looking in the mirror per se, it's, you know, what am I in this city or what is, you know, how do I exist in this particular place and time? Um, Hyde Park Art Center has been around since the 30s. Southside Institution, amazing place. Um, it's an art center, meaning it's got community function, it's got classrooms, it's got lecture halls, uh, it's got lots of exhibit space, computer center. Uh, again, this idea of a very mixed program, a program in a way as a, uh, a set of things, an ecosystem. They uh, eventually were able to get a long-term lease. I think after 10 years, they can purchase the building for like $10 or something from the University of Chicago. Uh, Army built this, I want to say in the 20s, this C-shaped building, and then f filled it in later on when it was U of C printing. And uh, that's the space that sold everyone, which is that courtyard filled in. Two stories. It doesn't look very big there, but it's bigger than you might imagine. You know, context shot um, of the neighborhood. Essentially, you know, behind the building are railroad tracks for Metra, residential towers, park on the other side of these, and lake on the other side of that, not too far away. You know, we started early on thinking of a tight budget project, $4 million, which included uh, everything. You know, all new system in the building is a gut job, all new systems. So we started immediately thinking in terms of components, what could we add to the building to uh, give it a presence. Uh, early sketches, you know, showing that two-story space, revealing that it used to be a courtyard, uh, a catwalk, which you'll, you, I'll talk about, it's a digital facade. Uh, you'll see another image of this, but we're still trying to get them to do the lowrider show in the space. I think we'll be successful someday. Uh, later renderings. Everything here is built except this upper level of screens, uh, but all the cleats and structure is in place to do it when they continue to fundraise. Uh, 
you know, maybe an earlier section of, you know, projectors that project onto this facade and, you know, the possibility that the gallery could really turn into multiple kinds of things at any given moment. Sure enough, they're using it that way. Uh, early elevations. We move the entry to the north. The, the road that goes by this is one way, so the entry actually was a problem from day one. How do they get a presence on the street so people know where they are and, and how do you get people into the building? So this actually ended up, in the end, being a whole new addition to the north end. It used to be the loading dock that we took down. You know, these steel bay windows, et cetera. You'll see these things. The gallery, very important to open it up to a small plaza. It is a community center as much as anything, after all. Uh, and you'll see some slides of this in action. The lowrider show. Now, wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> I mean, look at that bicycle. I would go to a gallery just to see that. Uh, but, uh, and, and by the way, the ceiling can hold the car, uh, so we could get it done. Uh, but that the gallery could also be traditional again. That, you know, the, the idea is that they don't collect works, so they change the shows quite frequently. And you know, the, the real thing they kept asking us is adaptability. You know, we want to do all kinds of shows here. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to put you through some music. I didn't choose this music for the animation. <coughs> this was very early on. Uh, and this is the kind of thing we showed to the aldermen. We, we need, really needed a lot of community support for this. And we prepared very hard for this, expecting, oh good, you can't hear that too much. Um, we we uh, expected some resistance to this uh, from some of the neighborhoods. So we had to present this at a public meeting with the aldermen. And uh, I, I never had this happen. We, we got a standing ovation. Uh, people, people then, the only questions they asked were, you know, like, how is the digital facade going to work? Uh, and, you know, it, people loved it. It was, it was like a slam dunk, and we weren't ready for that. Um, so it was a real pleasure to work on. Part of it, though, I'm not trying to take credit for it, because the Hyde Park Arts Center is a much loved and well-respected institution on the south side. Um, digital facade, you know, I'll show you it live in action uh, uh, how that works, but these were some, I had met this artist at UIC who worked on videos that when your shadow got in the way of the projection would actually, you know, cause those things that look like butterflies to change their patterns. They weren't butterflies, they were little macros written into his programming. So this is the finished building. Uh, you might have heard of the artist Inigo Manglano Ovalle. He did the first digital piece. It was kind of this barcoded thing that would slowly scroll across the facade. And this would kind of move up and down a little. There's a weather vane you can just make out there. The color, the speed, and the scale of those bars would change according to the weather data that's going into a computer room and then being projected back through the projectors. We had a fellow from Argonne National Laboratories working on this with us. Well, well, we didn't do the programming at all, actually, I should say, but he was great. Uh, and I you can't really get a sense that it's moving laterally. But this was made, I'm sorry it's me, but one thing we didn't, uh, we didn't, honestly, this is going to make us sound really dumb, but we didn't realize, <laughs> we didn't realize what you just saw was, uh, let's see if I can play it again, nah. um, that the projectors are set up with cones of vision, right? And they're calibrated to hit the screen exactly. So when you're walking on the catwalk, you can actually find yourself between the cones of vision and there, oh, here we go. And you start to disappear like that. And we didn't notice it until the first time we went up here for the first projection. And I know some artists will use that uh, fact at some point. <laughs> um, opening, this was slides taken from the first opening. Uh, you know, I had to do a lot of work inside relative to circulation. Ben Nicholson's uh, amazing labyrinthian piece painted on the gallery floor, his drawings. 
all kinds of really interesting stuff. And there's the old facade, and we had, I don't see it in this slide, but we had, we had done one sample of a paint that would match this brick. And we all just stood up there and looked at it, and the director, Chuck Thoreau, and we're looking at each other like, we don't need to paint anything, let's just leave the concrete block in the windows. You know, that's what it was. Why, uh, why try and hide it? So uh, we left that. Um, that was the first show. Second show called Home of the Brave allowed the public to come into the gallery and pin up works. This is very early on. By the time the show closed, these walls were covered. Uh, but it shows another important aspect of that facade, which is that there's, uh, there's those overhead doors which open up. And the interior of the gallery is connected to this modest plaza outside. So I love this one, because they had, they had invited this kind of, I don't know, I want to say gypsies or traveling circus crew out uh, to do some performance, uh, set up tables barbecue going, you know, it was, it was absolutely fabulous. And you, you know, you meet everybody in the neighborhood and it was really great. Um, so they'll do these kind of things, you know, well into the foreseeable future. You know, if Inigo's piece was very high tech, which the facade can be, uh, here's an artist who did something much simpler, just did cut paper and hung it in the facade uh, and it's like walking through a forest, when, um, through that catwalk with the sun. You know, here the sun's coming through directly, but even at night with the street lights, very subtle. It's, it's just beautiful. And the same thing, you know, at night the light coming through that again, equally beautiful. So uh, again, this notion of a community center that opens itself up, and every time you go to this place, it's going to be a little different. Uh, I threatened to show this to the students in the workshop. Uh, yes, it's a map of Chicago, but it's also a musical score uh, drawing done by John Cage. And the way it worked was that, you can't see the colors so well, but I don't know, I want to say there's about a dozen different colors here. And I, from what I understand, he would hand copies of this to musicians playing the piece at the time that is the score you're looking at. And I don't know, you, you know, to the oboe player, you know, you're, you're red. You're the color red on this piece of music. Hand it to him and then, you know, I guess, say, start playing. <laughs> so, you know, amazing amounts of interpretation uh, <laughs> necessary. Um, but I always like that map because it's, uh, it's a map, but it's also a, using the city to make a new piece. <laughs> Uh, of music in that case. Uh, I'm really reaching back into the archives for this one in hopes of embarrassing my friend Mark Linder. Uh, we did this competition, is it 10 years ago? Where's Mark? More than 10? More than 10, like 20 years ago? 16 years ago. Uh, the, the Berlin competition, when, when East and West Germany uh, got united again, if I can say it that way. There was this competition, Brandenburg Gate, uh, the wall, the Berlin Wall ran up here. I don't, it never literally jumped the window of uh, the river, but the, you know, they certainly policed it. And then I think the only fragment left is right there that they saved, and then it kind of you know, wiggled its way up here. So on the right is East Germany, on the left, West Germany, and I think you can tell by the different urban patterns, you know, the different sorts of developments in East and West Germany, but the competition <coughs> was to take what was known as the Spreebogen here, this whole area, now a park or then a park, but historically training marching grounds for the military. Um, the only building left on here really was the Reichstag, which I think you've probably, if, you, if I had a photo, you would recognize it as you know, the building, uh, one of the few buildings left standing after World War II with the, with the dome kind of bombed out, uh, redone by Rogers, uh, Foster, sorry, uh, 
in, within the last 10 years. So anyway, Mark and I did this together, and Mark, I, and Bob Somel had been trying to get something off the ground called DUB, D-U-B. It was sort of a, a, you know, we were a group, we were trying to do a number of different projects that had to do with all, all manner of concepts, one of which was called seeming. And I think Mark and I, anyway, we understood what would probably win this project, you know, would be a bar that goes from west to east or east to west, right? Something really stupid like that. That's what won. Um, and we were going to do that. Our idea was to multiply the kinds of contexts, to multiply these seams between those. Uh, and, and really, it's, it's more about blurring as opposed to defining the edge of, you know, formerly East and formerly West Germany. And huge program, you know, all government buildings. Uh, the only one they were saving was the Reichstag. I can't, actually, I, I misspoke. There was a second building uh, done in the 50s or 60s, kind of a nice building that was on site too. Um, but again, this notion that we we jump the river, we keep some park, and you'd have a whole series of uh, types of spaces. Some of it might seem, you know, almost medieval in scale. Some of it would be, we had all these kind of ideas about open spaces. Um, it was really, again, meant to, I suppose, knit things together, but in a very, very different way, a very different strategy. This is just a study model. We had to ship over there. Uh, well, I didn't get a picture of it in here, but a, a fairly large scale model, white model. They, it's funny, they sent all the teams who registered a, an injection molded uh, uh, Reichstag building to put on that model. <laughs> we thought we got that in the mail and we're like, this is the level of detail they want on our model. You know, it's, and all the columns and everything. Uh, another urban project, uh, it was a temporary one uh, that we were approached by the MCA. UIC was involved with this. Uh, and I ended up giving a, an elective class at UIC, so you know, uh, students helped out with this, and <coughs> in parentheses, Garofalo Architects gets free labor, right? I mean, I'll, I'll hold on to it. Uh, but, so we did this seminar. And the site analysis consisted of, now this is January in Chicago, flying kites on site uh, to get somehow track the wind, which would later turn out to be quite a thing to deal with. The um, building by Kleihus was built, uh, I want to say early 90s. You can tell I'm terrible at dates. But you know, it's been much criticized because of its aloofness. And part of that is this big base that it's on. <laughs> You know, most of the exhibition space is up on these floors. So you have this huge set of stairs, uh, and it's kind of off Michigan Avenue, and you know, it's a pretty gruesome photograph because it's, again, dead of winter. But that's the, the, we, so we were given this plaza, all this stuff, all this space to deal with, to make a temporary installation. We started thinking of a few things right off, right off the bat, you know. These early photos of the Statue of Liberty, being built in Paris before it was shipped over. You know, these kind of temper, this was a temporary structure we were at being asked to build. And, you know, that's temporary in Paris. Diller Scafidio's Cloud Building, another temporary building. Unfortunately, the Tilted Ark by Richard Serra, now temporary because it got ripped out of there. It wasn't meant to be temporary. But even John Haydick's uh, drawings of these kind of figures and characters that would come to a city, come to your city and haunt you for a while. Uh, we thought of all that. The students were making wonderful uh, concocted material samples that we might or might not use. I don't think we used any of these, but I sure like, you know, they went down to the district in Chicago where clothing and shoes are made and got these things and started to put them together. Um, lots of diagramming, again, to we weren't given a program, right? It's just like, do a temporary installation for us. No program. So we started to think what could happen there. The only, the only constraint, there were two constraints. One, there would be a weekly market on site in the summer. 
And the second was we, we weren't allowed to attach ourselves to the building in any way, which was harder to deal with. Um, we started to work through this and started to you know, think about structures that somehow would almost gracefully genuflect or kneel down and accept the public into this space, not so much the building. Um, one of my favorite models that we've ever done, paper clips and twisty ties. I think it took about a whole 10 minutes. And then photographed it and put it into Photoshop. So this was an early study, though, of this structure, one of those kneeling structures, you know, way out of scale and all that. But the idea is there. Um, skipping way ahead, I'll just go through the systems real quick. Precast concrete weights, they're foundations. Couldn't drill into anything down there. Uh, but they're also benches. Uh, Unistrut, if you've heard of that, it's kind of like an adult erector set. Um, but I'll talk about the joints. The, the, this is part of this idea that you get a material, but you push what that material can do in efficient ways. Wooden decks, uh, these kind of lounge items, which you'll see, and canopies. In, in the summer, it's kind of brutal here. And, terms of the summer sun on this dark plaza. And then the white things are the, the weekly market that we wanted to contend with. This is construction. Uh, we had to have the forms made out of steel and they cast three of these a day. So this was, these are all done, I think a month before we started installing this in April. Uh, and they, you know, they bring some to the site every day and set them. The, Unistrut system starts to go in. It had a cable system that would make it rigid because these things, some of these are 20 feet long and they're just like spaghetti, they wiggle. Um, and uh, I'll show you one of these joints. That was the real breakthrough to make a joint that could produce the kind of angles we needed. The deck, everything was designed to be taken apart and either donated or reused somewhere as opposed to just thrown away. Um, more building shots. You know, there's like two kinds of students, right? The kind who will work in the rain and the kind <laughs> who, when it's sunny, will test out the equipment, as it were. But we had, we had some rough days there, you know, cold, icy rain. Uh, we had a lot of fun. This is it completed um, from the second floor windows. Um, this deck is this one. We had to check through security every day, um, and we're going through one day. It's pretty much all built, but we're fine-tuning it. And the security people who were never very friendly to us all of a sudden said, hey, uh, you know, it's, we're all checked in. Like, uh, there's some people on your deck last night. I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, I can show you the film, but they're having, they're having sex up there. I'm like, no, I don't want to see the film. <laughs> We didn't plan this, but from the street here, you can't see what's going on up there. But what these, what these people didn't know is these are cameras up here, <laughs> which the security guys check every morning, right? Uh, but we considered it a sort of a success that, <laughs> that somebody figured it out. Again, lots of events there. It's a very popular place. You can start to see these joints uh, a little bit better. Um, John Malkovich came for an event one of my favorite actors. Um, the other thing I didn't talk about was the lighting, these LED strips, uh, which were in between. The, the decks were designed with spacers so that these lights could be slipped in. Uh, and this was during the Malkovich event, obviously images from some of his films. And details. Again, there were two types of joints. And all these holes and you know these pivot connections allow us to adjust this thing uh, in all manner of positions. And they had lights in them too. It's like a four inch LED strip in it. Some of it, as you can see, got pretty complicated. But Canopies. Uh, we uh, brought in Joe Burns from Thornton Tomasetti and said, is this thing going to stand up? And, you know, three or four days later, we had the canopies much more solid, and he goes, I can't figure it out, it's too complicated. So 
we just we made a bunch of these things. They were sewn by a laundry I use up the street, uh, dry cleaners, uh, and we just put them on gradually until we thought, you know, in the wind the structure was being compromised a little too much. Very unscientific, <laughs> um, but it worked. More shots. This is gas piping. You know, I wish I could say most of you know 90% of this is planned, but we were trying to figure out how to make these communal lounge sculpture-like things. And I was lecturing at downstate Illinois, and for about a half an hour, I'm behind an Illinois gas truck, and it's got this yellow pipe in a roll on the back of it. And I'm just driving behind it, and all of a sudden, you know. <laughs> took out my phone and called the office and said, I got it. I know exactly what we can use. So it's gas piping. Um, so, you know, there's all, I've said this is about ecosystems, the talk, and you know, there's all manner of data, mapping, diagramming. And again, we're, we're asking the students to look into this uh, for the workshop. And I don't know if any of you saw this in the New York Times Magazine. I want to say two, three months ago, but uh, it's sort of top secret stuff, but they had, a, had an article on the people within the State Department developing this software that would constantly uh, put in data, uh, its position, you know, its whereabouts, uh, and connect it with all the other data in there so that they could try and predict things like a terrorist strike. And really, really interesting stuff. I, I have a hard time believing this would actually ever work, but I put it up here because it is another kind of a, an ecosystem, if you will. It moves, you know, it's a 3D program. It's not a static image. It's something that is read by somebody uh, constantly. Um, one final thing, I'm gonna go through this quickly. I think, I'm, I think I've run much longer than I wanted to. One quick one? That's well, actually two. Two very quick. <laughs> two very quick. Uh, we did this project for the loop. You're familiar with Chicago, the L trains, and the loop that defines the downtown, uh, Block 37, you know, uh, Millennium Park, Art Institute. And Stanley Tigerman is constantly organizing mostly a group of younger people to think about the city. And we were assigned the L in one of these groups to think about. And of course, we immediately started to think about new stations and some kind of landscape piece that could be on, you know, you could cover this and, and create, you know, get more land out of the deal. Uh, if you start to put things like parks up here. Uh, there's other things we thought of, like what programs could you add almost as saddlebags to the, to the L, which don't really, you know, who cares about sound when you're swimming laps, right? So the train could be up here rumbling along and you could be swimming. Uh, and people are underneath you, to, I don't know, buying a hot dog or something. Um, and then the real breakthrough though, this is something that's continued in a lot of the other work, is to not see it as a conventional park, but actually to see it as a productive landscape. Chicago has lots of parks, but we don't have agriculture. And so we started to think of this whole upper plain as something that was agricultural. And you know, you have cows and sheep and maybe some pigs up there. And you know, it'd be quite an amazing view out certain windows. Uh, and of course there would be other program that you know, didn't, didn't care about the noise like bowling and clubs, uh, things like that. So we started to think about these stations, what they might look like with the corn growing above and <coughs> markets below. Uh, and I, you know, I can even hear some of you laughing, but we were dead serious about it. I still think it could be done. Um, and you know, producing images like this that would show it, you know, this would be basically three stories off the ground. And the ability to maybe put in a tower occasionally. The sort of next thing we did with Tigerman though was to think about these ideas at a larger scale. And for us that meant how do you get the goods into the, or onto the site in our case? Um, how is the city changing, you know, as manufacturing either changes or leaves the city or is deemed uh, too toxic? What happens to those lands? Um, 
you know, what, what happens to development in general. And so we started doing these kind of mapping exercises. Uh, and then we got invited to the uh, History Channel's competition, which I think some of you heard about. You know, and again, I, I think it's a disease with us. The program's given to us and it, they said, uh, we want you to envision Chicago 100 years from now. And that's it, you know. I mean, maybe a few terms about sustainability or whatever, but, you know, Chicago is the preeminently engineered city, I would say. Not that all cities aren't engineered to a degree, but we didn't want to just concentrate on Chicago. We thought, you know, we had to look regionally and we had to look even beyond the region and start coming up with some of these fun facts, which are, when you think about it, pretty terrifying um, in terms of things like ecology. And our idea was to, in a way, promote sprawl, but do it in a productive sense. Like this is Broad Acre City, which is very utopian, but had some amazing ideas to it relative to production of land and some really cool vehicles. Uh, the, uh, we also look back at how, you know, as the states got bigger through these huge land pur uh, purchases, people like Thomas Jefferson here developed this one mile grid, which is still so much in evidence when you fly in an airplane. So Chicago's here, western edge of Illinois is here, and so we were essentially for this competition, we thought of ourselves as looking at that kind of scale. Um, and promoting different land usage in the city, but also all the way west. And it had to do with these land use classifications, but just also, or more importantly, I should say, how the land is used and what is it used for, and different mixtures of that land based on, uh, based on ecology, for one. Uh, and so that's the city as it exists, but you know, if you, for example, we were proposing all traffic goes away. What you need of it, you put underground. And think of, this, think of the area you gain above ground and what would you do with it if it all of a sudden were devoted to landscape and agriculture. Um, we thought about building heights um, and how it's, you know, this is more what's happening. They're just increasing the possibility for taller buildings. But we thought, well, if if you increase height, then you got to do something with density, uh, i.e., make make less make it less dense on the ground, and you know allow some of these landscape programs to come in. And we thought about uh, these kind of wind uh, turbines and tunnels and things. Uh, this was less developed, but totally feasible. We uh, had something we called a, a duct that would run all over the state on the one mile grid again. All transportation's underneath in that, as well as services, air. Uh, and that's what feeds downtown, but it also feeds agricultural lands. And again, you, you gain all this valuable square footage uh, if you do that, if you take transportation away. And this was the model that we, I think some of you are aware of this, that you, know, you had to put up a model and four hours and take it down four hours later after judging. And our model was very, uh, this was at the event, our model was very much trying to show graphically the new uses for the towers just by, you know, these uh, colored uh, inserts that had to do with landscape and information. So I'm sorry I'm going so fast, but I, I'm way over time. The original Mayor Daly. I don't know what that program would be, but I'm going to end with this one because I think one of the more important things about uh, forms of organization, ecosystems, is an office. And we very much like working, collaborating with people who don't think like us, who bring in expertise that we don't have, but also people who uh, get excited about ideas and are willing to try things they've never tried before. So. We sort of do one of these for almost every project we have. Uh, who would we bring in? Who would we want to work with in the perfect world? So thanks for listening.